In this class, I wanted to wrap up the discussion about medium access control. So far, we have been discussing about CSMA and we talked about CSMA CD and uh, CSMA CA, which is used in Wi Fi. So, CD stands for collision detection. And CA means collision avoidance. So because in Wi-Fi we cannot really detect collision, uh, what we do is we use uh, virtual carrier sensing in order to do collision avoidance. Okay, so we try to, before the collision even happens, we try to prevent it using an RTS and CD. So these protocols are used when you don't have a centralized coordinator. So, uh, so in a case, if we consider Wi-Fi for example, we are given a particular frequency band, let's say 2.4 gigahertz, this is an unlicensed band. And somewhere over here, uh, the government gives us 80 megahertz. And they say it's a free for all, anybody can transmit in this band, it's unlicensed. Provided you keep your power levels, transmitted power levels below a certain level okay, specified by the government. So it's an unlicensed band and you can have many different technologies here, not just Wi-Fi, you can have a Bluetooth or any other technology. Okay. So in this sort of a situation, you can have uh, many people, let's say you have set up a Wi-Fi access point in your house and you have let's say a mobile and a laptop or whatever right? and somebody your next door maybe your neighbor he too has an access point and he has his own set of devices connected to this now who is going to coordinate between these two if you want to avoid any sort of uh, say interference so it's very hard to do that because you really don't know there could be a third neighbor there could be 100 people in a building all setting up this wi-fi and they all want to use this band so there is no central coordinator to prevent or uh, to control the medium access So in this sort of a situation, we use things like CSMA because CSMA does not require a central coordinator. If you have some information to send, you just do a carrier sense and you can send it off. Okay, in CSMA CD, you can immediately send it off. But in CSMA CA, you have some sort of a waiting time. Okay, so you, before transmitting, you wait for, we said DIFS plus some random time and then you start transmitting. Yeah, and if there is a collision which you detect either by when you don't get back a CTS or you don't get back an acknowledgement, okay, depending on the exact protocol you are using, you say that a collision has occurred and then you back off appropriately. Okay, so it's a very uh, decentralized protocol I should say. is has turned out to be quite successful in using these unlicensed bands okay so there is also an unlicensed band in the 5 gigahertz range so you will have uh, of course this is much wider than 80 megahertz i'm not sure exactly the width okay, but there is more bandwidth available here in the 5 gigahertz band uh, so these are unlicensed and so useful for technologies like Wi-Fi yeah, or Bluetooth or any such thing. So besides these unlicensed bands, there are also licensed bands. So it, it could be, let's say around, uh, let's say over here, there may be some band allocated for 4G 
and of course soon there will be 5G auctions also so the government actually sells the spectrum to company and uh, only the companies who have got the spectrum are allowed to transmit there okay so let's say one band is let's say there are several of these 4G bands sold and maybe one band is used by Airtel another one is let's say this is all by Airtel this one may be used by Jio and so on okay so different companies are allocated different bands <coughs> okay and, and of course in different regions in the country different companies may own different bands right so Jio doesn't have to use exactly the same band everywhere in the country there could be slightly different bands okay. and of course they could allocate more than a, this particular band they could allocate something over here for example it may be for 5g or 3g or whatever so suppose a company has got a particular band exclusively for use then how do they use it okay, so csma is not a very efficient protocol <coughs> if you consider in wi-fi <coughs> Everybody is waiting for this diff's time. Okay, let's write that down. So suppose somebody finishes a transmission here, you wait for DIFS, and then you have a random wait time. And all this time is wasted. Nobody is using it, right? Even if this person is the only person transmitting, he still has to wait. And there's a lot of unused time and there could be collisions and so on which reduces the efficiency by a lot okay. so suppose you are given exclusive use of a particular frequency bandwidth what can you do why you know why why should you use something like csma which is inefficient so what we do in uh, cellular technologies is something different we would not use bare bone csma we would want to be more clever so that we can utilize the resources more efficiently so let's think about it so suppose somebody has a particular frequency band and uh, i'm going to draw time here on this axis and I will draw a frequency here. So suppose this particular band has been given to let's say Airtel. How are they going to use it? The Airtel knows that nobody else, a non-Airtel user is not going to use this band. It's prohibited by law. So Airtel sets up let's say a tower, uh, let's say a 4G tower. Now there are several mobile users which are connected to this tower. So this uh, Airtel 4G tower is, is acts as a central controller over here. Okay. And of course there are there may be another tower here another another 4g tower let's say both are from airtel they, they could be of course vodafone or geo or some other tower here but there is no interference because they are using different frequency bands okay so geo may use this one so both of these are let's say airtel even if this geo tower is somewhere nearby airtel people don't have to worry because Geo has a different frequency range. You can just use a filter, a bandpass filter, to get rid of this geo signal. Okay, so you can just you can only remove your own signal of interest and remove other frequencies. Okay, so you don't have to worry about. It. So within this band, how do we do uh, medium access control? Because uh, of course there are several people who want to transmit to the tower and the tower also may want to transmit to several of these users. 
So what we do is we divide first of all this geographical region into cells. Okay, there could be, let's say the this is one cell around this, this is another cell around this tower. Okay, and what we will do for now is just focus on one cell. Uh, you know how exactly to divide up, uh, you know, prevent interference between one cell and another one is also a challenge which where the Airtel company will have to figure out how to do you know, and for different technologies of course they have different ways of dealing with it but we will just focus on a single cell so suppose there is a tower and there are many mobile users here how are the, how are they going to divide the resources among them so that they don't interfere Okay, so let's let's look at that question. So one way to do it, so we'll think first of all we'll think of ideas and then we'll put it all together to see what exactly 4G does. So one idea is that uh, we divide we say that uh, we give different slots in time to different users. So let's say that this is uh, user 1, user 2, user 3. So let's first of all focus on this band, frequency band. And what we will do is we will divide time into slots. And uh, I'll just call this the base station. Okay. So let's say that uh, U1 wants to transmit to the base station. So let's say the this tower is setting a schedule and it says which slot, let's say this is slot 1, this is slot 2, slot 3 and so on. This slot is reserved this duration and time is reserved for U1 to transmit to the base station. Nobody else is allowed among the other mobiles to transmit during that time. And this one could be used for U2 to the base station and so on. Okay. So this is one way to do it and this is called time division multiple access. So it's a straightforward idea, you divide it uh, time into slots, each of these is a slot and you allow only a particular user to transmit in that slot. Okay, and So this is called the uplink, what I have shown over here. So I just write it here, uplink means users transmit to the base station and downlink is the reverse base station to users okay. so of course certain slots could be reserved for the downlink to so let's say base station transmits to user 2 here base station transmits to user 3 and so on Okay, and uh, we can repeat this so we can repeat this schedule every so often and I could call this a frame so this set of slots together would be one frame in this cellular uh, setup Okay, 
So the whole schedule could just repeat the downlink and the uplink. Okay, and uh, you might wonder how does how do they know what are their particular slots? So some slots in the frame could be used to give the schedule. So let's say the downlink map and the uplink map. Those are the technical terms that we use. So, okay, so this is the UL and DL. So the, the, the maps could be given uh, by the base station itself. It's, uh, certain slots could be used within the frame to give this scheduling information to everyone. Okay, so usually the first few slots in the frame have this information. So the base station will say in slot number so and so, user so and so is supposed to can use it for uplink. Right, and such and such a slot is used for downlink from base station to the user. Okay, so user 2 will know, let's say that this is number 5. User 2 knows that it's, it ha it's going to receive data in slot 5 and it can transmit in slot 2 to the base station. Okay, from this map which comes usually at the beginning of the frame. So fine, this is one way of preventing interference. There is no collision or anything like that. Be and we are very efficiently using all the time slots. Okay, there is no random waiting time or anything like that. Okay, so it's, it's very good and efficient. Now, is there any other way to do medium access? Uh, so like I've drawn over here, we have divided time into slots. Can we do the same thing in the frequency domain? You know, can I divide frequencies into something like slots, into some sort of bands? Because we know that if different frequencies can be separated from each other using these filters, you know, like geo signal was completely eliminated by using a particular filter by the Airtel people. So, in fact, your mobiles would be doing that. They'd be using filters to remove as frequency bands other than the frequency of interest. So can we do that within this also and allow different people to transform? So let's uh, look at that and let's say that this is time, this is the same time frequency diagram. So this is Airtel's band, this particular band is belongs to Airtel. So let's uh, split up these, this frequency, this could be a large let's say 20 megahertz and you give let's say 1 1 megahertz. And uh, let's say that the base station says that I am going to transmit on this particular band to user 1. I am going to transmit here and of course somewhere here let's say that it, it's saying that this particular band is for user 1 to transmit to the base station. This is U2 transmitting to the base station as well. Okay, so this could be one way to do it. Okay, so you divide uh, now frequencies into s small narrow bands. So these are narrow frequency bands which act like slots, like we had the slots in the time domain, they are sort of like slots in the frequency domain you can think of. Right, and uh, they could be allocated for different uplink and downlink between different users. Okay. And of course, uh, every so often you might want to change this. Okay. You know, suppose a particular user does not want to transmit anymore. Uh, 
uh, why do you why should you allocate any resources to it right you can uh, maybe change this schedule a little bit but in general this is what we could do and each user can just filter out whatever he wants right so user 2 for example only has to uh, care about the signals over here So these are of interest. To uh, let's say user two. Okay. So this particular mechanism, which I have discussed, is called uh, frequency division multiple access. or FDMA. So what does 4G use? You might be curious. Uh, we've talked about TDMA and we've talked about FDMA. So what uh, 4G uses is actually a combination of both of those and it uses something called OFDMA so 4G LTE okay. LTE is the most common 4G technology pretty much almost become universal there was something called WiMAX which was a competing technology but it lost out for various reasons so 4G LTE uses something called OFDMA which is a combination of uh, both TDMA and FDMA so O stands for orthogonal frequency division multiple axis so what do we do here let me draw the same time frequency plot And we, this is the band we are interested in. This is, let's say, the Ayrton band. So we divide time into uh, frames. So let's say that there is a particular frame. And uh, of course, it begins with a preamble. So everybody needs to be synchronized. First of all, everybody needs to know when the frame begins. So this is where the preamble helps everybody time sync to, to exactly when the frame begins. Because relative to the beginning of the frame, they need to know where their slots begin. And of course, the preamble is also helpful in doing clock synchronization. So they sync to the base station's clock. And it also helps them do channel estimation. Okay, so they want to estimate attenuation and so on. So clock synchronization to the base station's clock. And it tells you when the frame starts. And it helps you att estimate attenuation. Okay, so not only does a channel not only does the channel the wireless channel attenuate signal but it also causes things like phase changes okay so a signal gets reflected we said from many different objects so the the attenuation or uh, so essentially this phase has to do with the exact delay of a signal that too has to be estimated So now what do we do after this, we give a DL and a uplink map at the beginning of the frame 
and then something very interesting is done uh, let's say that we begin with the down link what we are going let's say th this much time is let's say allocated to the down link now different slots and frequencies are assigned to different users and they don't have to be very nice looking so it could look like one of your uh, jigsaw puzzles that you have right as as a kid you might have used jigsaw puzzle and uh, so you may have something which looks like this so this is a down link so it is the base station transmitting to users so i am not going to write the base station here it's obvious base station to users so i just write the user number so maybe these this range of frequencies and this duration and time is allocated to u1 this could be allocated to u2 this could be allocated to u3 and so on and you might actually have multiple of these tiles i just call this a tile because it looks like a tile on a wall right and right and you may have multiple tiles allocated to the same user that too is allowed so this tiling information is there in this ul map so each user knows exactly they are they from the preamble they know that the frame has begun and then they immediately figure out what is sent in this dl ul map okay and uh, they figure out what which particular tiles belong to them in the downlink uh, time okay then after the downlink we have the uplink which is users to transmitting to the base station so in this period of time everybody is in the receive mode all the users are in the receive mode and the base station is transmitting so here they flip the mode so the users go into the transmit mode the base station goes into the uh, into the receive mode so let's say that there is a short gap to allow that you know the switching from one mode to the other now the users are going to transmit and again we can have a tiling of some kind okay so this could be let's say user 1 this could be user 6 user 3 and so on. so it's a combination of both tdma we are dividing up time into slots but we are also dividing dividing frequency into bands which gives us this sort of a tiling scheme and uh, normally to do this sort of thing is a very very tricky thing to do because uh, how do you exactly remove whatever you want you know and get rid of everything else usually in a situation like what i showed earlier let's say jio and airtel they actually have to have a gap something called a guard band between them okay to prevent interference between them if you have jio sends exactly up to the last frequency at which airtel's band begins then we are in trouble because uh, each of their signals might actually overlap into the other and cause some interference so there is something called a guard band put over here between them to prevent that so you are not allowed to transmit a signal within those guard bands okay so there may be a guard band here too and just put gb for guard band and there could be let's say vodafone i'll just say v a vodafone idea okay and using some other band now in this sort of a situation we can't afford to have guard bands here because then we'd be wasting a lot of uh, bandwidth 
I mean, you may have, let's say, 20 different users simultaneously transmitting. If I have 20 guard bands, I'd be using up a lot of frequencies. So this OFTM is a, we won't discuss the details, but OFTM allows uh, the transmitters to transmit signals essentially without a guard band. It ensures that these different signals are orthogonal to each other. Okay, and how that is done is using a clever technique, uh, but we won't go into this, right? If you take an advanced communications uh, class, you learn about it. So let's just believe that this is working and you are, they are all allowed, they can transmit pretty much up to the frequency where the other person's band begins, other person's narrow band begins and they can efficiently use the entire frequency region okay, allocated to the particular company. Okay, so OFDM essentially allows them to use all the bands without any guard bands. That's all we need to know over here. Okay, so the base station is going to allocate different bands, different tiles here for uplink and downlink to different users. So you might say, if, why do we want to do it this way, you know, uh, why don't we just stick to TDMA, you know, or why do we want to use something like a combination between both of them. Now it turns out that uh, actually the attenuation that different users face in different of these bands, in these different tiles actually, is different. So this may be actually, this particular uh, band, it may be, uh, maybe there is less attenuation for you to compared to U1 okay because after all the signal is going from the base station to user 1 and it's going to user 2 and there are all sorts of reflections we said right it's going to user 1 user 2 it bounces off them okay. and uh, so effectively the attenuation at these this particular frequency range could be very different for the different users. So what the base station does is that it actually through the preambles the users actually figure out what is the attenuation that I am facing and they send that feedback you know the, I haven't drawn the full frame that there is some slots some particular uh, slots uh, here which allow the users to send back some feedback to the base station about which particular tiles are actually good for them. So let's say here U2 had very little uh, attenuation, it faced very little attenuation and here it was the opposite. So let's say this was good for U1 and but bad for U2. Just because uh, the multipath was such that these frequencies, uh, you know, actually faced destructive interference at U2, but it was pretty good at U1, right? So, because we have this quite wide bands here allocated for 4G and for 5G to be even wider, uh, you do see this sort of a, uh, these sorts of scenarios where certain tiles, certain ranges in the frequency bands are good for certain users and not so good for other users. Okay? But that may not stay the same throughout. You know, like maybe these are mobile users, so the, the attenuation maybe after some time is actually pretty high in this region for U2, but it's actually becomes good, let's say, for U3. Okay, so so a few frames down the line, this DLUL map may actually change. Maybe these particular, this particular tile is allocated to U3 because it's good and maybe U2 gets some other tile which is good for it. So continuously in time, users are estimating the attenuations they face and uh, they would appropriately give that feedback to the base station in some slots allocated over here for different users to communicate 
to the base station and the ULDN map changes over time. Okay. Also not every user has to be given slots because after all if somebody is not downloading data then why should he be allocated slots that would be a waste. So only people who want to download will be allocated slots or want to upload they would be allocated slots. And if they are just silent, then you don't want to allocate them any any particular tiles in the uplink or downlink. So the question is, how do how does the base station know who wants to transmit or to receive? And that is where we have something called contention slots as part of the frame. So let's just call this contention slots so how do we use these contention slots so let me just uh, group all the contention slots in different frames so let's say these are the contention slots frame in the first frame so I'm just clubbing them together even though they are separated out in time in time there is a gap between the frame and uh, let's say that these are the contention slots in frame 2 So users now who want to download, let's say, maybe they weren't allocated any tiles, they have to communicate that. So certain slots are not allocated specifically to users in the frame, they are, they are called contention slots and anybody can transmit them. So now let's say that user number 7 wants to transmit, so it wants to transmit to the base station and say, you know, I want, let's say, this much. I want to download a file, allocate me at least uh, a certain set of, let's say a certain set of tiles in the upcoming frames. So how is it going to do that? Uh, these are contention slots in which anybody can transmit. This is let's say frame 3. And here maybe U, U9 also wants to transmit to the base station. So how are they going to access these slots and uh, you know when there is no controller centralized person saying who is going to transmit. So you can guess what the answer is. So essentially they use uh, some sort of a carrier sense multiple access scheme to try to transmit here. Okay, so they could, they would do let's say a carrier sense and you they transmit and uh, you know so I've clubbed these together just to make it easier to understand so let's say that U7 ends up transmitting here to the base station and he gives a request and in the here the base station let's say in the receives the message okay, so the base station can use uh, either the DLUL map as a sort of acknowledgement okay it can maybe if in the next few frames it allocates something to u7 it you know that could be a way of signaling to the user that uh, its request has got through or it could actually reply in a dl uh, slot so Let's say there is a broadcast slot in the downlink. Let's say this is for a broadcast. So the base station is sending to all the users. And within that, it could send an acknowledgement to this request saying that you have, I got your message, right? And maybe U9 does CSMA, maybe it's for the only one who transmitted here. It's possible that two people transmitted at the same time because of which there was a collision 
they see that they didn't get a reply from the base station in the broadcast slots in the in the next frame and then if there is a collision they do a random backup okay so let's say that uh, u5 and u6 sent at the same time and there was a collision and uh, because of that they will do a random back off so that uh, hopefully they end up transmitting in different slots the next time so 4G LTE uses OFDMA like I mentioned and you might wonder how exactly is does a physical layer deal with this so we are saying that OFDMA we are giving a certain tile uh, within the time frequency plane to each user so how are they going to actually transmit information because we just talked about a single carrier frequency till now in the physical layer right so we said that there's a certain frequency FC and we said that what you do is you take this particular carrier frequency and then you modulate it so what are we going to do here right so essentially what OFDM allows orthogonal frequency illusion multiplexing it says that what we can do is that we can divide the frequency band let's say we have a large band Okay, so this could be let's say FC this is the frequency allocated to let's say Airtel and there's a let's say quite a large band allocated by the government so what we do is we divide it into small narrow bands and uh, what we end up doing is that it's almost like we have a different uh, center frequency for each of these narrow bands So let's say this is one narrow band over here, this is another narrow band. So each of these acts like a center frequency, it's almost like as if uh, you, I mean while transmitting you have a separate narrow band channel, okay I'm just going to call this FC dash, okay which is, has some offset and it's almost like you have this narrow channel and you essentially take this as your center frequency and you modulate it appropriately so for this narrow band so I'm just focusing on a small slice of the frequency spectrum in this larger band so for this narrow band the center frequency is some FC dash and in the middle of that band and uh, it's almost like I'm dealing with cos 2 pi fc t fc dash t and sin 2 pi fc t dash okay I'm almost dealing I can think of this narrow band as just having these center frequencies and I can do any modulation that I want on this And uh, you might say, what about over here? Le let's say I have a, another frequency here. So this is the center frequency of the next, next bar narrow band. And uh, now here I have cosine sine 2 pi fc double dash t that that's it this is like my carrier frequency and I can do any modulation here on in this band
So what we end up doing here is that uh, you can, I mean, uh, let's say there's a transmitter using OFDM. He can actually send one symbol on this narrow band and simultaneously another symbol on this narrow band. Okay, and you, each of these particular symbols uh, basically contains some information. Okay, if he's using BPSK, he's sending one bit per symbol. But he could use something like QPSK or QAM also. That's, that's not a problem. And in fact, you could actually use different modulation schemes. So you may send more information on one of these narrow bands compared to another. Okay, so it, it's a little bit tricky, but to th you can think of OFDM as being multiple simultaneous modulations on very narrow band, very narrow bands in this larger ch channel. And there are some advantages to doing this which you can study in any communications course if you're interested, right? And so where does this OFDMA come in? Well, it's because uh, we are doing a multiple access, orthogonal frequency division multiple access. So here uh, DM stands for orthogonal frequency division, multi uh, frequency division uh, modulation. Uh, I, I, I beg your pardon, it's not modulation, it's uh, multiplexing. So, uh, so here we are using essentially OFTM is, an, is a basic modulation technique which sort of puts together all these narrow bands together and ensures that one narrow band signal doesn't interfere with another narrow band signal. And OFDM is in fact used in Wi-Fi. So uh, when, it, when the access point sends you information, it is using OFDM. It's actually sending you multiple narrow bands of signals, okay, each of which contains some uh, data bits of information and LTE also uses OFDM but it also uses OFDM for multiple access where people can simultaneously send or simultaneously receive as the case is here okay so each of them is sending using certain of these narrow bands let's say here for example U1 is using this set of bands to transmit and U6 is using this set of bands so OFDME is just OFDM modulation, but uh, certain people are given certain uh, of these sub-channels, okay, these uh, narrow bands essentially to transmit okay, at different points in time. Okay, so FDME is dividing the frequency band into small into smaller channels. TDMA divides it into time slots, and uh, OFDM a essentially combines it into uh, combines both together to divide it into tiles of uh, contain each tile is essentially a group of frequencies and it exists for a certain amount of time so this is uh, effectively how 4g works and uh, i wanted to talk about something else which you may have heard of which is called cdma So CDMA stands for Code Division Multiple Access. And so CDMA was used in uh, 3G technology. It's not uh, used that much in, I mean in uh, 4G at least I'm aware of only OFDMA in 4G. But it was used in 3G and it might find various applications, you know, people might use it again somewhere else. So what is CDMA? So uh, if I look at the time frequency plane, so I'm given a particular band here. This is my, my band of interest. 
and let's say there's an Airtel pay station and several mobiles what I showed earlier is where we tie this either into frequency slices or time slices or a combination so what CDMA does is it allows multiple users to actually use the same time frequency tile so it might look something like this you have let's say this is user 1 using this particular time frequency play, uh, time and at the same time user 2 and user 3 and so on they are all using the same time so this means, might sound counterintuitive I mean how is it possible for multiple users to share I and mean, to actually transmit on the same time frequency tile and still not interfere with each other. Okay, so clearly if they are separated out in time, uh, you I mean you can easily just focus on a particular time slot and get your signal. Right? Or if, if you are given a particular frequency you can filter out everybody else's signal and just focus on your band of interest. But how do we do this where you want everybody potentially to be sending in the same range of frequencies at the same time. So this is where the magic of uh, CDMA comes in and uh, essentially what we are going to use is something called a spreading cone. So let's say that uh, we are, we are using let's say BPSK just to simplify matters and let's say that U1 wants to send a cert some information let's say A cos 2 pi FCT this is what he wants to send and his signal of course is between uh, let's say some n over fc right uh, for some value of n it lasts for a certain amount of time which is a multiple of the the, uh, the time period of this particular cosine and u2 wants to send uh, maybe say another uh, symbol for this amount of time Now if these two get added up it's a problem because how do you separate them out they are sort of mixing each other. Right? So in fact in this particular example you would get a zero signal okay? if there is a receiver if the base station is hearing both of these and you know of course we are ignoring attenuation but they would cancel out and you would hear nothing at all. But with CDMA we want both of them to actually transmit these and get information across. So what we are going to do is we are going to multiply each of these with what is called a spreading code. So I'm, each of them is using a different spreading code. So what do these look like? So this is the time period let us say 0 to t. Uh, so I am calling this t. So C1 of T might look like this. Okay, so here it is plus 1 and here it is minus 1. So if you think of this as a series of bits where plus 1 stands for 1 and minus 1 stands for 0, okay. so this is like a code which is where 
code of ones and zeros, which is where it gets the name. But we are going to think of this as a signal, so we will say it's plus and minus. So notice that C1 square of t is 1. Okay. And C2 of t, let's use a different color. So C2 of t might look like this. Just choosing an arbitrary set of set of ones and zeros. So these codes are chosen so that both C1 and C2 are orthogonal. C1 of T is orthogonal to C2 of T. And how does, I mean, how is this chosen? Of course, there's a way, there are methodical ways of actually coming up with these spreading codes. But you can think that actually if you generate a random, suppose you generate plus one and minus one randomly in each of these small intervals, okay, for each of them, you can actually show that if this, this is long enough, then actually on average they would be almost orthog. Okay, that's, but anyway, let's assume that this is true which means that integral 0 to t, c1 of t, c2 of t, dt is 0. And so we will assign a spreading code to each particular user and uh, all of them are mutually orthogonal. Okay, so U1 is now transmitting not just his basic BPSK signal, but he's multiplying it by the spreading code. And U2 is also multiplying his signal by another spreading code. And uh, of course, U, let's say I, has spreading code CI of T and multiplied by whatever signal he has. Okay. So how is this going to help? So, so what if at the receiver, so, so let's say you are the base station and you are getting uh, all these signals together. Let's say that this is S1 of T my signal and this is SI of T. So what, uh, what the base station gets, he gets a sum of all these signals. Suppose there are n users. He gets the sum of these. So now in this particular case, suppose he wants to figure out what is the first user sending. What can he do? So suppose, let's say what I do is, I, I uh, what I'm going to do is I multiply this with uh, cosine t, uh, let's say I multiply this by C1 of t cosine 2 pi fct. Okay, and so obviously there is a full summation, but let's see what happens to the first one when you multiply this by C1 t cosine 2 pi fct. So I, of course, ignoring attenuation and so on, and uh, what we end up with is, so here I have C1t uh, A T cosine 2 pi 
एफ सी टी एंड दिस इज मल्टीप्लाइड बाई दिस टर्म ओवर हेयर so what do we end up with uh, well interestingly c1 square t is 1 so we end up with just a cos 2 pi f c t square which gives us what is a by 2 uh, 1 plus cosine फोर pi एफ सी टी सो सो दिस इज गुड न्यूज आई मीन द स्प्रेडिंग कोड हैज डिसअपियर सो सो वॉट वी आर लेफ्ट विद इज वॉट एवर सिम्बल दैट वी वर सेंडिंग इन टू वन प्लस cos 4 pi एफ सी टी सो वॉट वी कैन डू इज वी कैन गेट रिड ऑफ दिस जस्ट बाई इंटीग्रेटिंग ओके सो दिस कैन बी रिमूव यू कैन इंटीग्रेट ओवर टाइम पीरियड टी एंड देन यू वुड गेट रिड ऑफ दिस बट इसेंशली दिस इज अ हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी so this can be removed by let's just say low pass filtering okay since this is a high frequency uh, so the frequency here is actually 2 fc it's 2 pi times 2 fc t this is a high frequency okay and what happens when we multiply uh, anything else with uh, this particular term okay so let's say that i have s2 of t multiplied by c1 t cos 2 pi f c t so here what i'm going to end up is so this is going to be since i just chose a particular uh, symbol i said it's minus a so minus a uh, c1 t c2 of t Uh, cos square four pi f c t. Okay, and uh, this I'm going to write it again as two terms. C one of t, c two of t. One plus cos cos. I beg your pardon. Here it should be two pi f c t. So I end up here with cos four pi f c t. Okay. So we can again remove this second term using a low pass filter. so let's say we are left with only this this part of the signal the corresponding to this constant here so suppose you are given this signal and you want you know you are essentially left with here a by 2 okay so let's say that there are only two users so after my low pass filter i am left with this
C1 T C2 T So I give you this as a let's say a homework problem how would you uh, so essentially what you want is only this you want to eliminate the second term okay, so what the receiver is doing the base station is doing he wants to now know what is what has a what has the first user user one sent so he's done some mathematical operations i said we are multiplying by c1 cosine 2 pi fct and then we sent it to a high pass filter uh, sorry we sent it to a low pass filter and what we ended up is the, these two terms and I wanted to get rid of the second term because I want to know only what the first user is saying. Okay. So what I can do is I can just integrate this from 0 to t and we know that it these two are orthogonal, so this term vanishes and what we are left with is a times t by 2. Okay, so uh, this is just a constant factor, so I essentially it's telling me what the symbol which the first user sent. Okay. So similarly if I do the same thing, but instead of multiplying the received signal by c1 of t, I multiply it by c2 of t cos 2 pi f c t. I will get the symbol that the second user sent and so on, right. So this is how CDMA works. So each person has his own standard modulation scheme, BPSK, TPSK, whatever. He just multiplies it by his appropriate spreading code and sends it out. And then the receiver does these mathematical operations. Okay, he just multiplies by the appropriate spreading code and a little bit you know an integration and so on and he gets the symbol that he wants. Okay. So there are some advantages to use CDMA you know it's uh, it's very robust to multi-path. Okay, CDMA and actually even OFDM are robust to multi-path. And if you recall, multipath means that the signal that is transmitted bounces off many different objects and gets added at the receiver. Okay, so both these techniques can be shown to be very robust to multipath, which is why we use them in these latest uh, wireless techniques. Like uh, I mean, 3G uses this, and of course, uh, the current Wi-Fi. And 4G also uses OFT. Okay. So this is what I wanted to cover about uh, multiple access. And from the next lecture onwards, we'll talk about uh, switching. And switching is there in layer 2, but it's also there in layer 3. It's called routing in layer 3. So we'll start with new topics from the next lecture.